Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Tuesday, May 14th. Derek Van Riper, you know Sarah, Spritz, really all here with you on this episode. We'll discuss a big story on The Athletic. A series of stories, actually, from Ken Rosenthal and Jason Stark looking at the starting pitcher and what Major League Baseball could do to try and save it. And maybe we would have a little side debate as to whether or not there's a starting pitcher like problem to the extent that people make it out to be. A little hint to maybe where I stand on the issue, but uh, some other issues we'll talk about. Britt wrote a great story looking at a partnership between Perfect Game and Fanatics, which is very troubling at the youth level, and yeah. some efforts on the part of former big leaguer Travis Snyder to make youth sports better. So we'll dig into that a little bit later on in the show as well. If you're not in the Discord yet, get into the Discord. It's fun. Link is in the show description. Lots of people having a good time in there. We got team chats. We got non-baseball stuff, too. You want to chat about beer, food? We got that, too. Plenty of baseball talk in there as well. So let's start. Let's start with the starting pitcher problem as it is kind of referred to, right? So a lot of good stuff on the site today. If you want to read all these stories in detail, a lot of good commentary from Max Scherzer and Justin Verlander. When you pull back and you look at baseball today in 2024 and you compare it to baseball of the past, which has like this perfect font and is amazing because it's the past and the past is perfect and nothing bad ever happened in the past. What is actually the problem with starting pitcher usage, right? Think about what has changed over time. It's the, oh, we've lost complete games and guys get pulled out in the fourth inning all the time in the fifth inning. It's like, these things are common. We, we talk about them a lot in, in big moments, especially Blake Snell in the World Series, not getting to go through the lineup. It was a third time, right? In the 2020 World Series. Man, the last few years have been harsh, but those kinds of decisions, we live and die by those. We think about those moments, and sometimes I think we, we stretch them and make them bigger than they actually are as far as the scope of the problem. Because the emotions involved. High stakes. Totally makes sense. So I just want to start with each of you. Britt, you first. Is the way starting pitchers are used aesthetically a problem? Not counting the opener, just the typical starting pitcher and how they work, right? And this isn't a question of does this keep them healthy? It's does this really change your interest in watching and covering baseball if starting pitchers don't pitch quite as deep as they used to? I feel like we're going to disagree a lot on this episode. Um, to me, there is a there is a problem. Um I love watching pitching duels. I love watching two starters go into the sixth, seventh, eighth inning and the game being one to nothing, zero, zero. You know, I covered Max Scherzer when he was in DC and I used to love watching Davey Martinez go out to the mound and then return to the mound because Scherzer yelled at him and said, get the hell in more choice words back mm -hmm. in that dugout. So that is a great part of the game. Uh, you know, when Otani was pitching certain nights, people would go to watch Shohei Otani pitch not to watch him come out in the third inning. So yes, like, do I still love baseball? Yes. Can we acknowledge that the past wasn't perfect, but that we are trending in a, a dangerous way? Also, yes, because maybe people think there's no problem with starters only going five innings now, but what does that look like in five, 10 years? Are they going three innings? Are we using openers everywhere, right? Like if you look at the trend, it's disturbing. So I do think this is a problem. I do think this needs to be fixed because I love their analogy that Ken and Jason had about the NFL and quarterbacks. Those are stars. What if the NFL had it where you had a different quarterback every quarter? It, you know, people just wouldn't enjoy it as much. These starting pitchers, when they are really good and they are the Justin Verlanders and the Max Scherzers of the world, they are stars. People come to watch stars. They don't come to watch the bullpen take over in the fifth inning. Ah, yes. Keep that front of mind you know your thoughts yeah i'm glad you put in the thing about openers because i think openers would be the death of the game that's that's really bad because you can i do believe in this who's starting tonight i do think that's a big deal um and so who's starting tonight an opener ah, not the answer i want to hear not the reason i'm going to the game i'm not going to do the openers i never like the openers and the nice thing is they haven't seemed to take over the sport. We aren't seeing a lot of openers. It's It happens once in a while, but it's not that big a deal. So then it comes down to who's starting tonight. That still happens. They still go five innings. Um, and we've actually retreated from the very maximum where um, relievers were pitching almost exactly amount, the same amount as starters. We retreated from that a little bit. Um, so 
you still get five innings of the guy. When I think that it comes the the when the, the part where I agree with Brett the most is when it comes to like a no hitter. Because when you get to a no hitter, you know, we have these no hitter decisions where we're pulling them out of no hitters because they don't have the innings, they don't have the ability to go all the way through. And um I don't think combined no hitters are the same have the same juice. Like I, I want them to, but then I'm like, oh yeah, remember the time the Braves used five pitchers to get a no hitter? No, nobody remembers it. No. I do, Kent Merker. Uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I do think that that part is a little bit sad. Um, so I would say it, it's uh, a, a small, a, a slight consequence of, of the evolution of the game rather than. Um, sort of a death knell for the sport that's sort of how i put it right okay so i like watching pitchers pitch deep into games but i think the reason it doesn't happen anymore or what the reason it happens less than it used to is largely because relievers are so much more effective right the ability for a team to have a fourth or fifth or sixth reliever who throws 95 plus coming out of the bullpen that makes it easier to say it's the fifth inning. There's a runner on base. You pitched well. You're at 85 pitches. You could go more, but we've got this fresh arm in the pen that can come in and do better than you will likely do statistically because of the third time through the order penalty. Like if you look at a chart of how how deep pitchers were going into games, 2014 actually looked a lot like 1987 still. And that was only 10 years ago. It's the last 10 years that have changed a lot. If you start looking back for when did teams actually care about the third time to the order penalty? It was about 10 years ago. That, that became a bigger part of the conversation. And that sort of overlapped this ability to develop a greater number of fire breathing relievers. So, you know, when your worst reliever had to come into the game versus your starter facing the lineup a third time, when that reliever wasn't good, that was an easier decision to leave the starter in. It just became tactically so much better from a value perspective, trying to win games, right? To just go to the bullpen. Like, that's sort of the problem. Quick statistical nugget that totally supports you, just really quickly. Mm-hmm. 97 pitchers, 97 relievers have thrown 95 plus this year and thrown five innings. When we started pitch tracking, 22. Yeah. But that's no one's so saying that the stats don't agree with their time through the order stuff. Right. What we're saying is you would rather watch a reliever you don't know, Derek, than Max Scherzer or Justin Verlander gut out a sixth inning. Incorrect. No. So, what, no. Which which one would you rather watch? I would rather watch more guys like Verlander and Scherzer. The problem is those guys aren't getting hooks when they shouldn't get hooks. It's the fourth and fifth starter more often than not, right? Sometimes it's the ace. Sometimes it's the air quotes ace because everyone defines an ace differently, right? Some people don't think Blake Snell's an ace. Uh, in the story that Jason and Ken wrote, they had Darvish versus Steele as a matchup they were yeah. talking about. Both of those guys spent time on the IL this season. Both of those guys were pitching well and left relatively early in that start, right? There's going to be situations like that. I have no problem with that. If you're coming back from an injury, do what's right to stay healthy because I want to see you pitch for the rest of the season. I don't want you to go back on the IL because you went from the rehab assignment to throwing 110 pitches your first time out and that was too much, right? This is... This whole conversation about pitching comes back to just breaking pitchers too often, too. This is also part of it. And the goal, I think, is to not only keep guys healthy, but it's to win games along the way. And I think trying to do those things simultaneously has been the extra nudge that has made this even more difficult. To like, We're trying to preserve the old era of baseball with pitchers who pitch completely differently than they used to. And we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. A lot of the problem goes all the way back to the youth level. And what kids are trying to do and what organizations are, are searching for and trying to optimize for velocity and spin and the detrimental effects that have. So it's like you can't have your cake and eat it too. And then I feel like it's also challenging because the, a lot of the rule change ideas, there's a whole story, 12 MLB rule change ideas from people inside the game that try to fix this and say, let's get our starting pitchers to go deeper. And I like the spirit of it a lot. But many of those things, if they would even work as intended, would probably also have some unintended negative consequences as well when you start to break them down. So the problem is sort of multifaceted. The solutions don't really fit. I don't have a clear-cut answer either. Eno kicked something around that I hadn't really thought about as a way to possibly fix this, but it does 
maybe give us a path to make your worst reliever less appealing to use. And Eno suggested expansion. So how much expansion would we need before we actually move talent around in the player pool so that teams don't have bullpens just packed full of very good relievers? Well, take this number, uh, 98 guys who throw 95 plus, right? So that actually works out pretty well that every team has three of them, right? And if every team has three of them, you expand by two by two teams. That to those two teams are going to have twelve relievers. So that means that every team loses half of a reliever. Hmm. It's, Not it's unsatisfying. It'd be better if every team lost one guy who threw ninety five. If you lost one guy who threw ninety five, it'd be a little bit less tantalizing to make that choice in the in the fifth inning to go to a reliever because he's not going to be throwing 95 you know it's going to be somebody else that might work for a little while except they've expanded before one and two (laughs) and then yeah we just turned back the clock a little bit (laughs) yeah we've already seen teams like draft a guy who's a high pick who can throw really hard expedite him through the minors and oops you're up like verlander talked about in the story it used to be and i've had a lot of people complain about this in baseball to me that you had to hone your arsenal. You had to learn how to pitch. And -hmm. what's happening now, as you guys know, is we're just training these guys to say, throw as hard as you can for an inning or throw throw as hard as you can. Yeah. Like that's it. You don't have to do anything else. So it's actually a lot easier to create those guys than it is to create these Verlanders and Scherzers. And I actually thought that incentivizing a guy getting to six Scherzer mentioned that like in some way is important because it doesn't hamstring a team where they lose their DH or anything, but it does force a manager to maybe say, Hey, can I, can this guy get three more outs? Because I think most people are okay with starters 10 years ago. Like you said, in 2014, you know, I was covering uh, baseball on a beat. There wasn't so much of this complaining. We all know we're not getting back to the days of complete games and 300 inning pitchers that Mm -hmm. I think is fine with most people. I think where the problem lies is we keep talking about a guy going five innings. I can't tell you how many games I've watched this year where they don't make five. They, they come out in the fifth inning. That is like, that's not fun at all. Mm-hmm. Like if a guy's not ready to go, I watched Verlander come off the IL in DC and pitch a quality start. He pitched over six innings or maybe it was just that sixth inning. If he's not ready, if he can only go 80 pitches, guess what? He needs another rehab start. Why are we bringing guys up so they can throw 70 pitches and we can like slap them on the butt and say, great job in the dugout. You made it four innings. Well, like, because why? It, I, I think it's four innings is better than the other guy they had. You know, I mean, I, 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 I get like, what you're why saying. Are you coming up if you can only throw like then get one more? I, rehab I, think, start. I think there definitely is like a decision by some teams to really limit the amount of bullets that their pitchers throw in the minors. So then they come up with just like 50 or 60 pitches in their bag. And you're like, you know, you should, I agree with you there. Like, I think as a player development team, a player, a young player coming up should at least have 80 pitches, should at least be able They should to have 100. How are, like, so then even if they go 80, they've got a lot left in the tank. Like, if we are conditioning guys to throw as hard as they can and, you know, for as long as they can until they get taken out, why are we not conditioning them to at least go 100 pitches? So that 80 is max effort and they're not gassed and they're not hurt. I think a yeah. big part of the problem is the conditioning. And these yeah, guys are right. looking no, in, the, in the dugout I mean, in the fifth inning. I don't think there's a single person in AAA who's averaging 100 pitches per start. Right. And I think that sort of points back to the bigger injury stuff we've talked about before, where in an effort to get guys through the minor leagues, develop their pitches enough, not get hurt, but then be ready to eventually push their workload up more. We're trying to walk this tightrope that mm-hmm. seems impossible. Like the, the path from here to there, it may not have been right 30 years ago, but it's still not right today. Like it's, it's wrong for a different reason. I, that's, that's how I see the problem right now where it's like, okay, this is an attempt to keep pitchers healthy, but it doesn't quite work. That's the root problem yes. of all of this. Like, okay, we have to come up with some new solutions. The rule changes that you mentioned, Britt, with, with Scherzer trying to incentivize, instead of double hook, which is like a penalty for taking a guy out early, you lose your DH, you bring right. the starter out too early, adding incentives like is a good idea. Like adding bonuses instead of penalizing because guys get hurt. There's extenuating circumstances. Some guys get just blasted. Like you don't, I don't want a guy to have to sit out there. Is it fun to watch a game when someone doesn't have it? 
like Bailey Ober against the Royals that first start of the season. There's hey, no Bailey, way I'm got to go four. I'm way, <laughs> yeah, I'm way, I'm way against the you have to go yeah. six. Absurd. And there was one line in the piece that would that was like, this is why I would hate it. There was the the idea that you made me stay in the game till six, and that's why I'm hurt now. Right, because you kept yeah, you, you didn't have it. You just yeah. keep pushing through, pushing through. Yeah. You had a couple really heavy, heavy, like inefficient innings. You know, you threw 44 pitches in the first inning. Stay out there and throw 56 Yeah, if more we're advocating five. for counting innings better and counting pitches or counting stressful pitches instead of counting innings, the idea that you're just forcing someone to go out there for six, like somebody who might have 120. Like we watched in Little League. I was watching this guy had 85 pitches through three. <laughs> yeah. Good Lord. And I was like, Did you let this kid it? throw 85 pitches? <laughs> and then yeah. on top of yeah. that, it's three innings. No. But I think there are ways to do it where teams that like maybe are on the fritz of like, should we take this guy out? Should we not take him out? It, it, it gives the game back strategy, which I think the game has lost now that we have the universal DH, right? Um, I think it gives back a little more power to managers, maybe even front offices, who I'm sure would have input in, in these decisions as well, especially in the modern game. But I think maybe – as a fan, it makes things more exciting. Like, ooh, is he going to go back out there for the six? Or, you know, is he not going to? You know? Right. I no, I, I like this idea that, that we are having a battle for the six. I think that's what we're talking about. And I like this yes. idea of, like, doing something incentivizing to go on six. I would just like to push back a little bit. You know, Max and Justin, when they talk, often wear the hats of, like, MLBPA leaders. <laughs> and so there's... Yeah, they, I mean, they are. Yeah. So they, so sometimes when it comes up, um, you know, the double hook comes up, there's, there was a specific little thing in there, like, oh, it might devalue um, the value like of the DHs, right? Because they'd have fewer play appearances. They'd be, they'd be pulled out of games. And I just, ha I just have to push back a little bit because, you know, if we're talking about the future of the game, that's like, there are no full-time DHs and the only guys that are, there's like 10 of them. <laughs> so yeah. I, like if I was leadership I, at some level at the union, I'd say, Hey, let's listen, it's 10 guys. We care about those 10 guys, but it's 10 guys, you know, versus the future of the sport. Let's, let's at yeah. least consider the double hook because the other stuff that they're talking about sounds a lot more gimmicky, honestly, <laughs> like <laughs> stuff about uh, like a free substitution, defensive substitution. That's the stuff that like really gets old schoolers worked up. Like, uh, oh, yeah. we're just going to pinch run for everybody. We're just going to pinch defense. <laughs> oh, I hate the DH. Oh, we're just going to have a, we're going to have a defensive replacement for everybody. Just have a guy out there that just, just your shortstop and doesn't hit, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know. I think it would raise a lot of hackles, the stuff that he was bringing up. But the, the double hook is actually kind of a return to like National League Baseball in a way where you're like, oh, I'm going to yeah. lose this guy. I have to pinch hit. I have to use my bench. I have to think about things. So it's just a little bit of a pushback that I think that we shouldn't overvalue 10 jobs when we're talking about this battle for the sixth inning, that maybe the double hook is a little bit superior to some of those ideas that they had yeah and maybe in the world where the double hook exists you're going to start to have like some more versatile players on rosters like versatility gets valued yeah. in a different way that could be good could you well. lose your dh like could he move to the field like you know what i mean like could it be right yeah yeah there, there are little yeah. ways that you can kind of massage the rule yeah i think so I, I think the the bigger idea i had that doesn't seem to gain any traction ever is to think about relievers differently and one of the rule ideas you know, raise the three batter minimum for relievers. I don't even know if you need to make it a, a rule necessarily. And maybe the, the other option is to say you can only use three or four pitchers for the first nine innings, set that number where you think it should be and work from there because the starter could go three or four on a given day. Maybe they get hit, but have a few bullpen guys that give you length or train bullpen guys in a way where they have to provide length because then they can't throw 99. Yeah. They have to dial it yes. back. But you're yes. asking for something different, but also... The hidden benefit of this, aside from like reducing the number of pitching changes, which I think is one of the worst aesthetic things in baseball, and the, the changing the, the three batter minimum rule a few years ago like helped a little, we still see way too many games with five or more relievers coming out of the bullpen. That's just yes. that's a thing yes. that needs to go away. So if you can find a way to get relievers to go longer, four, five, six outs at a time, maybe even a little more than that. I think you also leave the door open for them to develop more pitches, possibly develop more command, and you possibly develop more starting pitchers by having relievers working in more bulk roles. I just think the 
the fire breathing short reliever is actually part of the bigger problem here too if you can reduce the usage of that by any of these means that might actually help make things a little bit better totally agree i think when you look at like how to fix the problem you have to think of like what these things will do ripple effect and i think we can all agree if you just get to the sixth inning if we're just asking guys who average five innings now to go to the sixth inning this isn't going to cause massive injury. This isn't going to be a massive workload shift, right? This is maybe guys saying, instead of throwing 100%, I'm going to hover in the 97% range so that I can make it those extra three outs. And maybe teams in AAA in the development system, like you said, will incentivize, will say, hey, you go six innings, you're going to be on the short list to get promoted to the big leagues, right? We want to see that. And so what mm. we're doing is we're changing the mindset of guys just a little bit. Like gone are the days we're not going to have guys throw 88 and try to, you know, fool guys and, and go nine innings. But I think just tweaking the mindset a little bit, like Derek said, can relievers, can you get us five outs? If you can get us five outs and we only need like three lights out guys in our bullpen. How much does that change the complexion of our roster? What yeah. kind of advantage does that give us? Right. So I think if you just if we just slowly tweak that mindset just a little bit, you could still throw 95. We just don't want you to throw 97 until the sixth inning. Then we want you to empty the tank. Right. Mm. If we can get back to that just a little bit, I think everybody would be happy. And it's not this huge, drastic change that a, a lot of people are, are worried about. And listen, could injuries possibly get worse because they're already at an all time high? So mm. I, I don't <laughs> think they could. I think if we did it this way and guys are Let's throwing see. less hard, yeah, right? <laughs> like if guys sure. are throwing less hard, if we're working at our suboptimal velo versus constantly going for the hardest we possibly can, that has to have a, a ripple effect that has to help guys, especially young guys. Um, you know, I just think there's so much wear and tear on their arms. If we can get to a point where we are living in that hard, but not all out range again, it, to me, it's a good thing. I, I thought that was one of the more doable things like outlawing pitches and some of these other rules. Oh my God. I just, no. how you know are the you going to is thrown 3% of the time in the major leagues? Like, come on. Also, how are you yeah. going to determine what's what guys have like combo pitches all the time? Oh yeah. I, it's not a sweeper, sir. Yeah. yeah. It's not a sweeper. <laughs> it's, a, it's a, you know, a slurve that moves, yeah, exactly. or, you know, like, yeah. in like any I don't sport, call it that, you know, in, in, in any sport rules that are so absurd that you couldn't, with just your your own eyes like come up with the was yeah, that a violation or not <laughs> yeah. how on earth like i don't want i don't want some board some like video board to have some numbers on it where it had this much horizontal break this much vertical break therefore it's a sweeper and now you're and in fact for throwing a sweeper. that'd be stupid there's some like rule book portions where um anything that comes from the umpire has to happen on the field so like that happened during sticky stuff. We were like, oh, couldn't you yeah. just get a guy in trouble for a jump and spin rate? No, you can't because enforcement has to happen on the field and he can't and he can't be looking up at the board and be like, oh, that was plus 10 X. So you're out. So I, I, I hated that one. Um, I, I still like the uh, maybe uh, active roster idea. You have to pick six pitchers for tonight. And I think that kind of dovetails what you guys are talking about. If you have to pick six pitchers tonight, don't you want one of them to go five, uh, five outs? Yeah, generally, you know, yeah. You kind of want your starter to go six. You kind of want to have a guy who goes five outs. You want to have your closer yes. or your backup closer. You know, you want to have yeah. your 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 mop up guy. You know, so yes. you have like you'd have you'd you'd want more out of each of your pitchers if you. And, right. and I think if we look, we I don't know if you put made the board of it, but um, the you know how often we've used five plus reliever or pitchers for start. Oh, it's it's bad. So yeah, I've got a few. There's a number of nine inning team games. I ran this on Stathead. Number of nine inning team games in the expansion era. So since 1961, where five or more pitchers are used. The year in which we did this the most was actually 2021. There were 1800 team games, 1806, where we had five or more pitchers. And compare that to 2000. Game. Wow. In 2000. That number was 827, so more than double the number more of team games. Yeah, and, and even even just comparing it to, geez, like 20, 2011, 2011 was 1,064 team games like that. We yeah. had 800, almost 800 more games like that. So if you yeah. if you say if I say six, it, it, it still captures most of the games. There's a lot more games than that. But it cuts off some of those games as a possibility. Even five, like even I, I five. Think five's fine. I, I think if you look I at think last five night, is good too. You need a so, long man in case the guy gets hit with a line drive in the first inning, you and he can be your mop-up guy. 
Yes. Those guys have kind of gone away. And I think you need to bring that back a little bit. Somewhere. Well, nobody wants to be the mop up guy is one of the problems. But if you if it's yes. your way into the major leagues, it's it's your way into the major leagues. I swear it's still an opportunity to try and develop into a starting pitcher a little bit that later. Too. You can have your you young have, guy. That used to be the thing on this. Yeah, yes, they the, used to call guys up, thing. put them in the bullpen, and then develop that's how they developed as starters. I, but, I think if you look at Monday night, there were 13 games. And so there were 26 starting pitchers. 22 of them went five or more. I'm okay with that. I don't think that's, I don't think six has to be the magic number for innings. I, I think five is fine. Five and dive is okay. You, you can live with that. But like exactly zero of them could have gone nine, right? Um, number of them that could have gone How many nine. Went six? I mean, you got to look at the pitch counts. Uh, so there were eight starters last night, Monday night, that went six or more. Of the, of the guys that went six, Five of them were at or above 100 pitches. Corbin Burns only at 85. Uh, yeah. Barrios 94. Lorenz 96. So Corbin Burns, if he was in a no hitter, could have maybe gone, could have gotten the no hitter. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think we have to get everyone every night to six, but I think if we're looking at fixing this, that is like the the carrot that we want. Like we don't need to push guys to go seven or eight, right? I think we can kind of all agree that if we can get guys to go six, maybe a lot of this like yelling and screaming over the starter goes away more often than not if we can just like tip the scales that'd be that, like, like one less reliever change one less reliever yes you know? yes like if we can just tip the scales that like most 70 percent of the time they're in the sixth inning they pitch into the sixth inning i think we can all agree that's probably fine right and one of the things that max scherzer was quoted as saying is that the st- the start that drives everybody crazy is five innings one earned run, 70, 75 pitches, where you do have more in the tank, but the bullpen comes in, right? So I ran a search, yes. another stat head search. How often do we have starts like that? And I changed the thresholds just slightly. I went starts that lasted five to six innings, no less, no more, 75 or fewer pitches, one run or less allowed. Same window of time, looked all the way back to the expansion era, and the last three full seasons, 21, 22, and 23, are the seasons in which we had the most starts that met that criteria by a pretty healthy margin, right? In 2023, there were 97 starts like that. In 22, yeah. there were 101. In 2021, there were 103. If you look at what was happening in the late 80s and the 90s, it was more like 65, 72 starts. Okay, so there's a difference of 25 to 30. That's one per team per season, one start like that. If you could get rid of that one start, would that make everybody happy or would it not actually matter that much? Because that's that's the difference right now as far yeah. as like those players getting taken out in those situations. Those are annoying. Those are tough games to watch and justify. Because you get frustrated are, as a fan, also, right? I think in the in the era of social media, like they get the like we our reaction is swift and loud and yes. you know, and it sort of reverberates quickly, even more than it might have in the past. I, I think that's a that's a fine goal is to reduce those by one per team per year. I, yeah. I know that doesn't seem like a lot, but I think that helps us focus on when people say, Oh, I don't think the double hook would do that much. Would it change one decision per team per year? Maybe. Yeah. You know, that's all we're then, looking for, like tiny turns of the dial, right? Just yeah. tiny turns. And that's why I like I would start with six if you have active pitchers because make it so it doesn't seem draconian. And the team's like, oh, yeah, most games only use six, you know, at most. That sounds yeah. fine. You know, you're right. You were then not you reducing. go down to five after a year or two. You warn teams it's coming. If it, you if give it, them time. If it works a little bit, maybe that's enough. Or if you want it to work harder, then you change it. But, but you also have to sell it to the MLBPA. And you have to sell it to yeah. you have to sell it to the cranks who don't want to change the game. You have to sell it to, you know, like you have to think yeah. of that all of these rules have to pass like certain groups uh muster and so if if it if it seems like these are not big deal changes that wouldn't change that much maybe that means they're more likely to get approved and then maybe they can make a small change and that small change would bring us back to more like the 90s and the 2000s where i don't think everybody was yelling about the death of the starting pitcher maybe yeah. i should have googled that first maybe there yeah. are some articles from the no, 90s like, about the death I, of the social media i mean people, even people in the early 2000s the and yelling about it <laughs> yeah i don't know i don't remember hearing about this i Started covering baseball in 08. I don't remember hearing about this until like the last five yeah. years. Yeah. I mean, it, really. it, even all the numbers um, that Derek is citing, like these, like the last three years are always like, yeah, you know, this, the I mean, standouts. He always had guys complaining, like older pitchers from the 70s, like, well, back in my day, we but used it to wasn't like this, innings. <laughs> but it wasn't like this league wide problem because guys were still going six innings, mm. you know, sometimes seven. 
you know, so it wasn't this huge issue, I think, where you saw guys were not getting removed for 75 pitches if they were cruising along in the fifth and sixth inning. Like that is for sure. So I think this is a recent problem. I think also, you know, you mentioned that PA has to approve. Don't they not? Didn't the Players Association actually yeah. didn't fight for that in the last CBA, which is why MLB was able to tweak the times again this offseason, much but, to the chagrin of the players. The on-field rule changes, they, they see, consult with the PA? The, the PA does not have to sign off on them, though. That's on-field. So there, there is some gray area in these rules that we're discussing, or okay. discussing, right? Like, for example, an active roster for tonight yeah. might be a roster rule. And so when people talk about we should have 11 starting pitchers uh, as a minimum, on, uh, as a maximum on the roster, I like that idea, but I think that's the zero chance of ever being happening because that's a roster rule that will cost pitchers jobs. Yeah. And so I, I like it as an idea, but there's no way the MLBPA will get on it. I mean, I'm asking the MLBPA to maybe say like, oh, yeah, 10 of your pl players may have their be a little bit devalued. <laughs> you know? And they're yeah. saying, nope, we can't do that. You know, so <laughs> so I think the 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 the, the stringent like uh, mostly like I like the idea. If we had 11, if you could only have 11 starting pitchers on your roster. Yes, we would go back in time. We would go back in time because you would have to get more innings out of each of those players. All right. So, but that breaks the rule. You can't take jobs away. You just have to tweak take how away. players are utilized without taking the jobs away outright if you want to get the buy in on something like that. Uh, the big question here, too, is why don't more pitchers just try to work like Justin Verlander, right? There's your template. There's your guy that's had an amazing career. He's going to go to the Hall of Fame. He's pitched forever. He throws hard. He's had no hitters. He's won World Series. He's had every. Every accolade a pitcher could want, Justin Verlander has done it. And one thing that he's always done well, at least especially early in his career, he'd go get the extra tick or two late in games, right? He that would was leave, he leave bullets in the tank. He'd leave gas yes. in the tank. Right. And in theory, I'm like, yeah, why don't you just do that? And I, I always thought you could do that. And our Friday shows with Trevor May have kind of highlighted to me, some guys can't. Like, it's not as simple as just taking a little off because if you take a little off, maybe you don't have the command. Or something doesn't move the same way, so it can kind of make your whole arsenal. You've fall engineered, apart. you've engineered a delivery that does this, so it's not always like I can just take the same delivery. Like he was, Trevor says that like Jake Degrom can't really throw ninety two the same way that he throws now. The counter argument to that is probably something Britt wants to say. It's like learn how to do it in the minor leagues. Then then yes. don't <laughs> then you're not a major leaguer because you couldn't yes. figure that out. And then I think. How bad is pitching going to be if if we change all these things and pitchers come back and they throw more like they did in 1992 against modern hitters? Are we going to create a game where every game is nine to eight because hitters just smash the crap out of pitching that isn't as good as the stuff they've had to learn how to hit? <laughs> well, no, because look at Scherzer and Verlander. They don't throw 92. Like, I, I think... Dudes. I, I know. I think you, what you're going to probably create is a more complete pitcher. I mean, that is part of the problem, right? Guys throw hard out of college. They still throw hard. Big leaguer teams call them up very quickly because they throw hard, not because they've learned how to pitch. So mm. the problem is everywhere. Um, I it's kind of weird to me. Like some guys can't, some guys can't pace themselves. Well, how come for a hundred years in baseball, that's what pitchers had been doing. Yeah. Now all of a sudden we can't do it. Jacob DeGrom maybe should learn how to throw a little less. He's been hurt nonstop. There's something about like the way we're just optimizing, you know, biomechanics and stuff. And we're like really dialing in on things. I, I, it sounds plausible to me that, that, you know, it's not easy for Jake DeGrom to take, take. I'm sure it's not gas. easy, but I don't think it's impossible for these guys to take a little off either. Got mm -hmm. you hear guys grunting when they're throwing as hard as they can. <laughs> yeah. There is a difference between throwing as hard as you can and throwing it 90%. Yeah. Well, I, I have an interesting table for you. One of the things here, um, we just saw uh, uh, on YouTube, we had a thing up about, uh, it's from Bill Petty from 2012 and Fangraphs about how Verlander um, had extra gas in the tank. And, and he was among the leader, leaders always in um, having a higher velo at the end of the game, the beginning of the game. Um, and so that's that's this idea, leaving in the tank, leaving, you know, not, not throwing 100% all the way through. Well, I just did this for last year, uh, and I just looked at the people who had the biggest differential between their fifth 
uh, inning velocity and the first inning velocity. So number one is Tyler Malley. Uh, number two is Johnny Cueto, uh, who left a, a tick in the tank. Mike Soroka, Tony Gonsolin, Vince Velasquez, Ryan Yarborough, Kenta Maeda, Pedro Avila, Johan Oviedo, Luis Severino, Justin Verlander, Luis Castillo, who does seem kind of like one of the workhorses of our time, yeah. um, leaves about a half tick in uh, in the tank. Luis Sessa, Michael Kopech, Tyler Anderson. It's not a list of standout pitchers. Uh, no. It's not a list that you necessarily want to be on other than the fact that Verlander and Castillo are on it. So I don't know. It's sometimes that we, I, I call this the Nolan Ryan problem where people are like, oh, well, Nolan Ryan did it. And you know, why can't everybody? And it's like, well, Nolan Ryan is one of the unicorns of our sport. And, and I think, you know, I also think of like, why didn't, why wasn't Michael Jordan a good coach? And, uh, you know, and, and to some extent, Barry Bonds is like, you know, for them, it's like, I did it, do it, you know? And, it's, <laughs> and uh, I see like everybody else is like, but I'm not Justin Verlander. I'm not Michael Jordan. I can't just do it, you know? Uh, oh, I inadvertently used his slogan there. <laughs> <laughs> I do wonder though, you know, if you win back five, 10 years, if those numbers on the pitchers were better. Like, yeah. You know, the pitchers nowadays aren't doing that. Yeah, so that, yeah, that list who's is left weird, though, doing it? You know, yeah, kind of yeah. veterans and it almost group, doesn't surprise me. But that group's not like a super healthy group of pitchers, though, either. I mean, there's some yeah. bad injuries in there. Mally had Tommy John surgery. Soroka's Gonsolin. been hurt a ton. Gonsolin's had shoulder problems. You know, Maeda has dealt with all sorts of stuff. Severino's had a hard time staying healthy. Some of those guys have turned into relievers. Like that doesn't seem to be the magic cure either, even if it's a small part of the solution that in and of itself isn't necessarily how we're going to get there either. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I'd like to see more years data than just last year. Yeah. Kind of look at, like I said, it's last year. We know guys aren't doing this. So of course it's not the top pitchers. We know guys are throwing as hard as they can. What did it look like five years ago? What did it look like 10 years ago? The, here's I, the, I'd be here, curious who's on that list. Here, here are the pitchers that last year had the most pitches after the sixth inning. Seth Lugo, Logan Gilbert, Ranger Suarez, Logan Webb, Tyler Glass now, Tanner Houck. Um, I can't read that. Uh, Zach Barrios? Wheeler. Huh? That's Barrios. Oh, oh, Barrios. Yeah. Zach Wheeler, Kyle Gibson, Aaron Nola, Jack Flaherty, uh, Tarek Skubal, Max Fried, Luis Castillo again. Hey, wait. That's a list of completely healthy pitchers right now. I don't think any of those guys are currently on the IL. That's a, yeah, that's a good list. Yeah, what is what? Uh, yeah, but it's not the same list of people who were like left gas in the tank. It was, it's more right. a list of what, what is it? It's a list of, you know what it is, it, what it strikes me as. It lists, it's like kind of not all of them fit this, but complete pitchers that have more than just that aren't just like fastball slider and yeah, have like a, a wide point. arsenal and like it's efficiency. It's being able to get deeper into the game because you're not walking a lot of guys. I mean, Glass on this list counts. too, but they, you know everybody yeah. else. <laughs> That's true. Like we didn't consider that too. Like guys who are just out there pumping fastballs at Max Vila are going to be gassed by the fifth inning. Guys who are using three, four pitch mixes. Well, maybe they don't show up in this big. Maybe they don't have another five miles an hour in the sixth inning. But they've got a whole different look for the third time to get them through that third time through the order. Right. Yeah. So I think point. it's, I think one of the things that's the more dangerous that they're not really talked about that much is this idea that we have to use our best pitches and we have our stock. I've heard this, we have a stock portfolio and we have to use, you know, just use your best performing stock for in, in stocks in your portfolio. Um, I think this list is a little bit of an argument that like, Hey, you can throw a pitch that's not so great to get to the sixth inning. Like, you know, Graham Ashcraft this year is throwing a sinker. It's not his, it's not a good, it's not that great a pitch, but it's better than the other two. It's he's better having three pitches than two. And I think that we have to kind of, maybe we have to do this in the analytics community is like prove the value of having extra pitches and like, and talk about it more and, and show it to pitchers. So they're like, okay, I'm not just going to be a fastball slider hundred miles an hour all the way through. Like I have to have four pitches. I have to have five pitches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem, I thought the article made a good point, is that like analysts can't, we all think getting in the sixth inning is good, right? We all think that that's better for the game. There's no way for analysts to measure the impact that has. So it has I, I, I think I think it's more that like the analyst will say, if my fourth reliever is really good, then he's better than 
this guy. Right. Statistically, he has a better chance, right? right yeah. That's all right. the... And that, that's the hook problem. That's that's the... Yes. And sometimes we. this is what came up with the Blake Snell decision. It might be a coin flip. It might be a 50-50. What do you do when yeah. you have to just choose because there's not an obvious right answer? That's where you start to use the incentive. So, like, that's... I, I do agree. Maybe if I thought some of the ones that Max came up with were silly, like, I do an incentive structure. If yeah. it's 50-50 in the sixth inning, then have an incentive that puts some weight on the other side. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right, it's a 50 because... 50 shot right now, but if I just keep them in there, I keep my DH. Yes. It does seem like, too, in this day and age, managers are more apt to say, let's go to the bullpen because that's easier to defend the fresh arm than when oh, they leave the starter I left in, them too, in long. too long. <laughs> yeah. There, I think, is that like no one will mention that, but, you know. Having been in baseball clubhouses for 15 years, you kind of see the changeover now. Managers used to be like, I thought he was going good. We left him in. Now it seems like managers are more apt to to go with the numbers or to go with the bullpen and the fresh arm because it's a lot mm. easier to defend. And also than, maybe they won't get yelled at and more like the analytics will get yelled yes. at. Yeah, I think right. that's so they don't have the, the analysts in their office after the game. Like, right. you know, yeah. I think I think that's a reflection of the changing mindset of a manager too. I think the – the present day managers are more on board with that. I think people who are more on board with that are being selected are and hired jobs. as managers as in the first place, as opposed to the guys that would have gone kicking and screaming into that. That group of managers has largely just been kind of moved out of the game. Maybe a and little some, bit. Some have changed. I, I think some there's a lot that. more fear of like how that gets perceived than there used to be for sure. People just don't want the blowback, huh? Okay. Well, hey, it's it's a reason. I mean, go watch press conferences from 10, 20 years ago. Managers used to like throw guys under the bus. They used to say whatever they want. Like you're right, they're different guys now. But like, I think a lot of it is, you know, you decide that you're not going to go with the analytics or it's a, you know, 50-50 and the team says, if it's 50-50, we're going with the the bullpen. And you, and you don't, you've got the GM and analysts in your office after the game. Like you get, you know, there's much more of a, we're involved in the on-field than there ever has been. Yeah. And so... You know, I think, you know, you want to keep your job, right? These are hard jobs to get. Yeah, you don't want to have a meeting with the GM explaining why you made that decision. Yes. (laughs) But again, like we said, if we have that incentivized structure, maybe they do say, hey, if it's if it's 50 50 or it's like our numbers say it's 48 52. Let's go with the one that gives us this little carrot. Right. And then you see maybe, you know, if it goes wrong, fans are like, well, they were trying to get the incentive. So I get it. And, and, you know, I'm not saying that we manage based off public perception, but I do think sometimes that yeah. the way the game has changed, it that creeps it definitely in there. matters. Yeah. yeah. Well, surely with all the problems we're having with pitching in the major leagues, but we're working on it in a healthy and logical way at the youth level, right? Like we are creating a structure for the future that is better than what we have at the present, right? Is that what's happening? Is that what perfect game is all about? Is that what they're trying to do? They're trying to make baseball better. Is that their goal as a company? Throwing up spin rates and velos on the board for twelve-year-olds oh, so right. that everybody yeah, can yeah. ogle over their their uh, fastball velo at uh, twelve, yeah. and thirteen, and fourteen. Yeah. Right. You, know, so, you know, it's like on the cusp of that world, right? Like your boys are a little, just a little bit younger than that. Yeah, we'll have to um, see. They they get good enough to to do that sort of thing. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, it, it, like I I think you know even in little league, you know, you have these rules where it's like oh, eighty five pitches, and you're like eighty five pitches, man. Like this, I just watched a kid throw eighty five pitches, and for the last twenty of them, after each one, he shook his arm a little bit and looked over at the manager. Yeah, and I'm like, what? And why did they leave him in to win the game? Because that game because it was a everything. playoff game. Yeah, it's a playoff yeah, it's game a... in Little League means everything. I'm not trying to just completely disparage perfect game. It's a it's a tournament showcase circuit. It's there are people that scout and work for the service that are are good, but and, and it gets story. exposure to some kids that might not see sure. the scout might not be able to get to otherwise. They they see in right. that perfect game. They're they're from some upstate Washington, you know, place that the scouts never go, you know. Sure. Right. There there are some positives to it. But Britt wrote a story about a partnership between perfect game and fanatics. And it drew the ire of the agents. And when the agents think something is bad, <laughs> must you know it's really bad. bad. <laughs> That's how you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for those who didn't see the story, it's just like a quick recap. Basically, to participate in the perfect game, since at least 2019, I think it goes back farther than that, according to emails I obtained, but at least 2019, you have to sign away 
your name, your image, your likeness, your signature, which is very, which is really, I think what really has bothered agents. You are giving your signature rights to perfect game. That's uh, like, that's your moneymaker, retired players. Like that's, that's the, they, they make money off of their signature. <laughs> Right. And it's just like a very weird thing, like perfect game and the sponsor. So like Dick's Sporting Goods or whoever else is sponsoring these perfect game things um, also has those rights. You know, it's kind of a scary proposition. You know, you're 14, you're good. And they're like, hey, sign these 300 baseballs and you're not getting any money off of it. Perfect game is now well, fanatics now has entered into this memorabilia deal. That's starting at the end of 2024 is going to roll out memorabilia so you can buy signed baseballs and cards and whatever else of these perfect game guys and the these kids are not profiting at all and i think it's a it's a disgusting thing really i mean we are now trickling down into like the amateur level where parents are signing away these rights and when i wrote the story i heard from a lot of people who were like oh my god like it's just a case of not reading a contract and i think over the years the language got even more airtight and it's you know, like they own it in away. perpetuity, like in perpetuity, what? which is like crazy. And like, I want to make one thing clear. Like if you get to the big leagues and you're like Bryce Harper, like you can, you know, your name, image and likeness belongs to you, but perfect game could still sell Bryce Harper, perfect game stuff and make money off of it. Still, that's insane. Um, With that, and you wouldn't be able to say anything because you signed you that contract when you were 14 or whatever. To play in showcase right. tournaments. Yeah. And maybe for a Bryce Harper, it doesn't matter. But we know the average big league career is what, three years? something mm -hmm. like that. So you have like a really small window of making money. And part of Asian's job is getting memorabilia and card deals and all these things. And if you've got thousands of autographs are floating out there on the internet already, like that's not good for getting a deal at all, yeah. especially because fanatics owns tops and agents are concerned about like what that means for card deals. That means that basically baseball's wing, like isn't, you know, like, you know what fanatics has and tops they are the only ones that have the likeness deal with, with baseball. Yeah. So it's likeness. almost baseball approved. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so almost weird. like MLB has approved this because it's MLB's sort of, you know, collectibles wing, you know, in a way they don't own them, but it's like, they won't, they're the only ones they've given a license to. So, yeah. Yeah. So slippery slope. If you're a parent, people have asked me like, if my kid was playing, I would go through that section and I would just be redlining stuff before I signed it. If I got to sign this waiver to play, I would be crossing stuff out, initialing it. Like I'd be making sure to black if out. If enough parents do that, that sort of stuff, if there's if there is enough pushback, then then Perfect Graham says, "Oh crap, we can't get the top talents anymore because all of the top, all the people who might be top ten picks are are rejecting our our contract." And then maybe, and I think you do have some leverage as like a top ten prospect, as a yeah. you know top ten prospect as a kid. And oh, he's not going to Perfect Game. Yeah. Like, you know, that would then that would start to send some ripples through the sport. I mean, I just think it's so nasty. It's so nasty to 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 think that these kids, these kids, parents and these kids are like, I get a card. I get to go to perfect game. Yes. Yeah, sign that thing, you know, but then and then they're like, you know, they get sequestered and put in a little room and here here for an hour. Next hour, just sign balls and be like yeah. that. I signed up for this. It's almost like um, no like child labor. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. it's bad. And, and it's a great job that Britt did on that story. And Britt, you had another story about Travis Snyder, former big leaguer, was a top prospect who has retired and kind of gone on to try and, and make youth sports better. And it's interesting that some of the stuff you wrote about in the story feels very similar because it's the same world that Eno is <laughs> describing where you have these kids that are out there, you know, practicing until 930 on a Friday night in the oh. middle of winter, which is... Yeah. That's not being a kid. That's that's yeah. It's like training for a job as a child, yeah. and that's not that's not how you get from from that level to the big leagues. People think it is. There's a, a misconception that if you just grind hard enough when you're a teenager, you will be a pro in whatever sport you love. And I think that has a ton of of long term negative consequences. And that was something that that Travis talked a lot about with you for the story. Yeah, it really does. And, you know, like I said, you're like living this world and like right now. And, you know, DVR, we both have kids, sons, and it's like terrifying to think of what the Little League world is going to look like when they get to that age. Because Travis talked about from nine years old on, he was the best player in Washington State. And that was his identity. He's nine years old and he's told, you know, you are good at baseball. That's that's you. That's who you are. 
Um, and I think kids are still figuring out who they are at nine, 10, 11 years old. And it's a really slippery slope. We have them specialize right away. We, you know, you're told, oh, you, your kid's good. Now he has to go to fall ball and he has to, you know, he has to play year round. He has to do these showcases. And, you know, what we're seeing now a lot is, you know, kids burning out, kids hating their parents because they feel like the parents only love them because they're good at baseball or the parents coach baseball and they become more of a coach than a parent. And what Travis is trying to do, you know, he's released a series of workbooks is, is you know, I have one, he sent it to me and it's great. It, it's kind of really thinking about stepping back and realizing if you're putting your kid in Little League at three, that's for you. You know, that kid, that kid doesn't want to be out there. He's three years old. That's right. for you. Um, so, you know, you can do that if you really want to do that, but you really need to be careful. Kids should be playing. Kids should be having fun. You know, take your kid out for ice cream when they win, take them out for ice cream when they lose. Like, you know, you, what you do and how you parent in youth sports have has ripple effects on what these kids are going to be. And almost every kid is not going to be a pro player and even pro players. Travis has spoke to a lot of MLBPA alumni. And, you know, I've seen this, unfortunately, too, just being around. They have no identity when they're done with baseball. They're told that oh, that God. is all they are. Divorce and they rates deal with depression, go through the roof. Divorce, depression, yeah. They lose money. They don't know how to handle their money. They have no more friends. Like all their friends like them because they were baseball players, right? So I think we have to we have to really look at how we are parenting our kids because it feels like the youth sports level has gotten so so much more serious than it was when all of us were growing up, and that isn't going the other direction, right? It's just getting more and more serious. And, you know, Travis wants to do something to stop it because he kind of saw the effects. He saw what that did to him. Uh, the first time he got demoted in the big leagues, he talked about how, like, he felt like his, the rug was getting pulled from under him. Like, he had never mm -hmm. been bad. He had never dealt with adversity. And he was told, like, this is, this, is, this is what you are. This is why you're good to us. And he really struggled to put that together. And you know he's not alone. So you wonder how many top picks – that were busts, essentially, like Travis was supposed to save the Blue Jays. Uh, you wonder how many of those guys fell through the cracks because we just like didn't know how to handle them. We didn't know what mm. to do with them as an organization, as people. Yeah, it's fascinating to me because um, parenting and coaching are not the same thing. And, um, and having a, a child in Little League really puts you in a really weird crosshairs in parenting. It's really difficult, actually. And the, the thing that's so hard is you, you, there are different things you want for your child um, over their lives, and they come into conflict when it comes to sports. So one is you don't want your child to have to have pain. You know, you kind of want there is a there is kind of a a, a parental feeling of like shielding your child from pain. But you can't do that. You have to get over that. And sports makes you sort of realize that they're going to they're going to have pain and you can't shield them from it. And it's not it's better maybe to not shield them from it. Right. And so there it, you shouldn't be helping that child lash out and be like, oh, it was the umpire's fault or was this fault or this part. And and yet you never want to be like it was your fault. Right. So, <laughs> you know, that that is a really difficult moment when they when they fail. It's really difficult. On top of that, you want to tell them something like you want to be rational. You want them to be think about their lives rationally. You want them to give a little bit of space between them and sports. And so you want to say something like, yeah, you like none of these guys are going pro, dude. It's OK. Like, <laughs> it's all good. Just have fun. Right. And so but at the same time, you want to tell your child they can do anything they can put this at their mind to. Right. So right there, you have two things that are just in total opposition. Yeah. It's like the trying to shield them from pain and try to keep them rational and keep them thinking and keep them separate a little bit from the sport. But while also telling them you can do anything you set your mind to, which are two things that you really want to do as parents and they will come into conflict in sports. And I am just trying to navigate that right now personally. And it's really, really difficult. The way I've sort of come about it is saying, hey, listen, look at your dad. There's ways to be around baseball. If you love it, then other than playing. So just think that, think about, think this through. There's lots of different things you can do in baseball. And then B, I'm here for you. If you want to train, you know, this summer, we'll train all summer. We'll get you ready for the new distance, get you ready for juniors. Like we'll do what you want to do. Like, you know, but you have to put, set your mind to it. And we have these goals. We are going to, we're going to long toss to 150 feet. You know, we're going to get you ready for 50, 50 feet uh, mound. Like, so, you know what I mean? So it's like, I try to walk the line, but it's really difficult. And other people have a little bit more invested in their success as a player. Yes. There's a little bit more. That's you. 
uh, where I yes. see that with other people where they like, you know, they invest so much in their child's success that their child is acting out on the field. Mm -hmm. And we see that a lot in Little League where uh, people are kicking helmets around and throwing gloves down. And you're like, dude, like this is supposed to be fun. So the one phrase that I've come up with that my child said, sort of um, raise, like rolls his eyes at, but I don't know. I'm going to test this out with you guys and, and the <laughs> listeners here. Um, so I tell him, you love our dogs, right? You love our, we have two little Chewinis. There's, there's seven pound dogs. You know, I tell him the dogs don't even know baseball exists. <laughs> they have no idea that thing exists. And I, next time you're having a hard time on the mound or something's going on out there, remember your dogs have no idea what you're doing. I think it's going to make your kids appreciate dogs a lot. Like the, <laughs> well, he loves like his the, dogs like so the best part like of having, <laughs> like The best part of having a dog is that you can have a crappy day. You come home and they're happy to see <laughs> yeah, you anyway. Right. Like that's like, that's totally. why many people love having dogs. But yeah, I mean, I know we got to wrap this up, but I, I was a high school soccer coach for 11 years right out of college. So I was a coach at a high school level, competitive, not, not like high level club, but like varsity soccer so like the highest level that a lot of kids get to play some kids went on to play college that i coached but a lot of small school players nobody went i don't pro. think i knew that about you so yeah so I, I did that for a long time and i i i think i hope i hope that will shape my perspective as a parent because i did see kids that i cared about a lot they weren't my own so i know it's different i saw them experience failure and pain and disappointment and you learn you're like hey this is this is hard like teaching kids how to cope with we worked hard coach why didn't we win we did everything mm. you said to do. We lost. What happened? Yeah. Like, you know, then you feel like, hey, I let them down. I didn't do enough. And I gotta I gotta regulate my own emotions and how I talk to them about those things. So you you I you think you underestimate no matter what your role is in youth sports, whether you're a parent, whether you got nieces, nephews, people close to you, you care about that play it, you do have a role in the kid just on how you interact with them around their activities. It's not to be sports too, being supportive, being thoughtful just being there for them in whatever way it is. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that's going to be a really hard thing to, to do when the time comes. My, my little guy's won, so I've got some a little bit of time before we get to Little League, but I'm sure there's going to be a million things between now and then that present a whole bunch of challenges. Uh, we should do a parenting podcast. I don't know, maybe not. <laughs> maybe that's a bad idea. I know people don't want a lot of that here, but that's sort of where we went because that's where the story was. So mm -hmm. I do think... A healthy perspective about youth sports would go a long, long way for a lot of folks out there. I hope people can find it. Uh, we're going to go. If you want to read those stories, plus the other stuff on The Athletic, theathletic.com slash rates and barrels is the best way to get a subscription. So be sure to do that. If you don't have one already, you can find Britt on Twitter at Britt underscore Droli. Find me at Derek Van Riper. Find Eno at Eno Saris. Find the pod at rates and barrels. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We're back with you on Thursday. Thanks for listening.